Hi, my name is Joe Paprocki, and I am the National Consultant for Faith Formation at Loyola Press, a Jesuit ministry in Chicago, where I've spent the last uh, 23 years, along with my colleague Denise, uh, who is behind the scenes right now, who's been here for 25 years. So we're two of the most veteran uh, employees at Loyola Press, and we love the work we do with the uh, Ignatian Jesuit mission of uh, Loyola Press. Welcome to the audacity of Ignatian spirituality. Uh, we're excited about our panel here today. You see them all on screen. They're in the house. Give away panelists. Let everyone know you're here. There we go. Thanks. And uh, we're going to introduce them each in a, in a second or two. Uh, but uh, let me just uh, give you a couple of housekeeping uh, details and then uh, talk about the topic uh, we're getting into today and then introduce you to our panelists. Uh, so first of all, we are in webinar mode, which means that you will not be able to turn on your camera or unmute yourself. The only people you'll be able to hear and see are myself, the panelists, and my colleague Denise, uh, who will be back for the Q&A uh, session a little bit later on. Please use the chat to introduce yourself to let us know where you're from, and we're just so delighted to see, once again, people from all over the world. That's just the, a tribute to Ignatian spirituality, that people all over the world find this speaking to their heart and want to gather and hear more, especially about this notion of the audacity of, of Ignatian spirituality. Um, if you have questions for our panelists, whether as a whole or individually, use the Q&A feature, please, for that. Um, and then finally, a recording will be available when this is all said and done, if you want to watch it again, or, or many of you are, are watching the recording now uh, because you weren't here live, uh, or you can send it to friends and so on. And so that will be made available within a, a day or so. So we're going to be looking today at the audacity of, of Ignatian spirituality. So July 31st is we celebrate the birthday of St. Ignatius, founder of the, the Jesuits. And uh, here at Loyola Press, uh, under the leadership of uh, uh, Denise, and I'm saying that the leadership of the month of July. She doesn't run the company, but <laughs> she, during the month of July, she runs our celebration of all things Ignatian. We spend 31 days with St. Ignatius on our website, uh, ignatianspirituality.com. And the theme that she chose for this year, which we're going to get into, especially starting with Paul in a minute, is the audacity of Ignatian spirituality. And, and so that's where we're going to, to turn to right now. Uh, after we introduce our panelists, we're going to talk about this notion of why Ignatian spirituality is indeed audacious. But let's meet our, our panelists first. Uh, here we go. And first, we're going to meet Marina. Marina Burzens McCoy is a professor at Boston College, where she teaches philosophy, and she also teaches in the Boston College Pulse Service Learning Program. Uh, Marina is the author of a Loyola Press book named The Ignatian Guide to Forgiveness, and she and her husband are the parents of two young adults, and they live in the Boston area. Hi, Marina. Thanks for being with us today. Thanks for having me. Looking forward to talking to you soon. Same. All right. Next up is Paul Mitchell. Uh, some of you may remember him from uh, a few of our earlier webinars. Uh, he was part of a panel webinar uh, uh, about a year or so ago. And so he's back once again. Paul uh, cares full time for his uh, sons, and he writes in the service of lay formation. He has taught all over the world. He's taught in Uganda, Chicago, Boston, Egypt. He's studied theology at the University of Notre Dame and the Boston College, once again, School of Theology and Ministry. And he's the author of a couple of wonderful uh, children's books about St. Ignatius, one called Audacious Ignatius, which in many ways gave inspiration to the title of this webinar, and the Examine book. Paul, great to see you again. Thanks, Joe. Great to be here. All right. Next up, Tim Muldoon. Uh, Tim is the uh, author of a, a number of books, a couple of which are the, the best-selling The Ignatian Workout, one of the first books I got from Loyola Press back in the day, and Living Against the Grain. And uh, uh, Tim teaches uh, once again at 
Boston College. Uh, he's in the Department of Philosophy. Tim, great to see you. Thanks for being with us. Thank you, Joe. Good to be here. And last but not least, friend of Loyola Press, uh, Father Alan Figueroa Deck, a uh, Jesuit priest. He is the Distinguished Scholar of Pastoral Theology and Latino Studies uh, and Professor of Theological Studies at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles. He's outnumbered today by our East Coast uh, scholars, but he's holding up the West Coast for us. He's the author uh, or editor of nine books, and uh, including uh, 365, um, let me read the rest of it, Dias, uh, Acompanados por los Santos. Padre Allen, bienvenido, es bueno verte. Just gracias. It's always a delight to work with you, Joe, huh? Thanks for Thank the invitation. You. Always is. Yes, I get to see Father Allen most years at the LA Congress, and we get the chance to to be with each other. Well, thank you to our our wonderful panel for for being here and for uh, getting ready to share your wisdom with us. Let me say a couple of words about this idea of um, audacity, and then I'm going to tap Paul to to share a little bit because he chose that title for. Uh, his book, which is a children's book, but uh, obviously he has spent uh, his life dedicated to um, Ignatian spirituality for people of all ages. So audacity, you know, if you look up the definition of it, it, it talks about a willingness to, to take uh, bold risks. And of course, I put the picture of St. Ignatius of Loyola next to this, not that uh, that's what you'll find in the dictionary, but it could easily be there because St. Ignatius uh, and the, the Jesuits uh, took and continue to take bold risks. Uh, a few of the other words that I saw associated with uh, boldness, daring. This one I thought was interesting. A disregard for conventional thinking. Uh, that, that to me was, was very strong. Uh, it's, a, it's like a swimming upstream. When you, when you say to someone that, that you have a lot of audacity, it often has almost a little negative connotation to it that you know you're going against the against the grain how's that for a title tim um you know you're taking risks and, and so this whole notion of audacity um is at the heart of ignatian uh, uh history and ignatian spirituality as well and you know in in his book um uh heroic leadership author chris Lowney talks a lot about the many risks that St. Ignatius took. And he, he Lowney quotes uh, hockey legend um, Wayne Gretzky, uh, who once said, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. And I, I love that. And, and so uh, this uh, idea of being audacious is taking shots and, and taking risks. So, Paul, you chose this for uh, your book, which just came out with Loyola Press, not that long. And um, I, I'd like you to, to read the quote that's on the page and then tell us a little bit about why did you words, use the word audacious uh, more than the fact that it rhymes with Ignatius. But go ahead and <laughs> read it for us and then just, you know, let's pick your brain a little bit about the word. Very good. I brought I brought along the book, so I know I'm I know it's like a little picture, but we'll go for the right. full multimedia experience here. Yeah, yeah, so, there we go. So, and as the years passed, the company grew. All over the world, they amassed quite the crew. In Africa, Asia, and the Americas too. And if you dare, the story can include you. For if, like our hero, you learn how to pray, plans to live with deep love will come right your way. And if on some days these plans seem too audacious, say, God, give me a heart just as bold as Ignatius. Um, All right, Paul, and tell us your a, a really late draft after the book, this was not the final page. Um, but my sister and I got together and said, what is it that we would like to communicate to our children? We wanted to invite them on this adventure. This can include you. You know, following Jesus is the adventure, um, and we're going to need help on it. Hence the uh, hence the last uh, the last line of "God give me a heart just as bold as Ignatius." So that's, that's what wonderful. we hope for our own children and yeah. for all of you listeners there. So 
Well, and it, it, it's a great um, attitude to instill in young people in, in the whole idea of faith formation. I just mentioned before that audacity is disregard for conventional thinking. Well, the gospel is not conventional thinking. And so all of our faith formation, all of our catechesis is indeed audacious uh, because it goes against conventional thinking. And what we're going to do here is now we're going to take this even further and look at specifically Ignatian spirituality and se several things. Each of you, each of our panelists chose one aspect of Ignatian spirituality to share that they believe is particularly uh, audacious. And so, Paul, we're going to start with you. You're going to start off a conversation for us. In a second, I'm going to fade into the background here and let our panelists talk uh, with each other uh, for uh, eight or ten minutes or so. But you chose the the prayer of St. Ignatius, the, the sushi pay of St. Ignatius. And certainly just you know, the only thought that I'll share about it is this is a prayer all about surrender and uh, to, to surrender, to trust, to declare your dependency on someone is is a risk. And so why did you choose the sushi pay as particularly audacious? Right. Thanks, Joe. You know, so I think, you know, going with the theme of, you know, yeah, tonight it's about the audacious or the audacity of uh, Ignatian spirituality. But it could easily be the title could be the audacity of you, right? You, the listener right now, you know, the prayer, the contemplative in action. We want and St. Ignatius would want you to be audacious, right? Um, and we all know those moments of how we really want to step in and be audacious. We also know the ability that we have, the tendency we have to, to hold back, right? And so for me, at least, the Susi Pei invites me uh, time and again into that audacity. Um, so I'll read it. I'll read it here. And then I'll unpack the, the four nouns that we, that we are, that we are um, giving over to God. So here it is. Take, Lord, and receive all my liberty, my memory, my understanding, and my entire will. All, all I have and call my own. You have given all to me. To you, Lord, I return it. Everything is yours. Do with it what you will. Give me only your love and your grace. That is enough for me. So God invites us into this adventure, this audacious life. And with these four things, we can say yes. So I'll unpack them a little bit, right? So liberty, which to offer, I think Ignatius means like an interior liberty, an interior freedom with this, particularly, you know, with his work on desire and desiring like what is holy, right? Memory, like what is more personal than our memory, right? You know, our recollection of all our experiences of how we've been accompanied by God our whole life our understanding, like how we perceive and interpret everything, you know, and and um, then our entire will. I think this is a huge one that, you know, we conceive of a plan and then act on it, right? It's not, and each of us has this plan inside of us, this work that only we can do. Um, and so these are just such fundamental things to like, who we are, right? And then we are offering these four fundamental things. There's no wiggle room, right? You know, God wants everything, right? And, and these, when you really sort of, um, you know, meditate on these four things, it's, you, we, we give it all um, over. So um, yeah, it's a recipe for all death. Yeah, that really resonates. Um, go, go ahead, ahead Marina. No, Marina, you go first, I'm after you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was just going to say that what really resonates with me, Paul, and especially what stood out to me is the word liberty, how much freedom there is in this approach. You were talking about interior freedom. Um, it made me think about how, you know, as a teacher, for example, I try to really give of myself to my students, but I've learned from Ignatian spirituality to kind of let go of outcomes and try not to think so hard about managing, like what's going to happen with what I try to give and to kind of let go into God's going to do something with this. I don't know what it's going to look like. Like I may never see the outcome. 
but to just have that freedom to try to do what I feel called to do and kind of let go of the rest. So I, I, I think that's a great word that you highlighted there. Tim. So yeah, I'll, 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 you know, tag team from, from the great observations, Paul, great observations, Marina. I, I very much resonate with what you just said about teaching. I, I, I get that. Um, I'll, I'll also highlight just the word uh, sushi pay. In fact, I saw somebody in the uh, chat just even said, what does that word actually mean? Um, and, and I'll say that this is a sneak peek. Denise knows this. I, I wrote a post that's going to go up on the dot Majus page, uh, I think a little bit later this month. Uh, but but I focus on that word sushi pay. It's a Latin word. It just means like take up or receive. And, and what strikes me about it, this, I had to do a little bit of research about this. Um, it, it's a word that actually, uh, for those who are Catholic, you know, may recognize that that in the Eucharistic prayer, there, there is uh, the priest offering to God the gifts on the altar, saying basically take these up and, and you know transform them into the body and blood of Christ. So, so Ignatius here is using the same verb very deliberately, and, and it's a different verb than in, in that same line, uh, receive. So, so the, the, again, Latin scholars in the room, sorry, um, but, but uh, sushi pay is take up the way that the Lord takes up the Eucharistic gifts. And receive is the verb achipite or accept, you know, so there, there's a very deliberate play there that Ignatius, my reading is that we're, we're telling God, hey, take me up, transform me in, in a manner that's somewhat like the way that you transform the gifts of the altar into the Eucharist. And I just find that very profound, you know, to say that here we are, these, you know, broken clay vessels that, that God is going to do something with if, if, we, if we let God do that down deeper, you know, into the subject of uh, audacity, I think, you know, we have to come to this idea of liberty, but liberty or freedom, as many great students of the spiritual exercises has noted, is really at the heart of what Ignatius is proposing to us to be truly free. I can't help but think that the ministry of Pope Francis has been an example of a pope who is unusually free to do a lot of things that, you know, kind of call into question some standard ways of thinking about the world. And that's just one example of someone rooted in this spirituality that, that exercises leadership, you know, in the community. But it's freedom for, you know, in our modern culture, there's a lot of concern about being free from this and free from that and free yeah. from the other thing. But it's freedom from something. And the problem with freedom from something is that it really doesn't say what you're for, and it really doesn't give you a purpose. You know, it just gives you a condition. But freedom for, in the uh, Ignatian uh, sense, gives you uh, a purpose because it's a response to your relationship with someone else, first of all with God, but also with others, you know? So it's freedom for something, and therefore it's it's a very positive, constructive psychologically healthy thing, I would say. So what does the, the praying of the sushi pay uh, each day do for a person? I think for me personally, it helps me think about the idea that um, everything I have is a gift from God. So I have to treat it that way that um, because we have a tendency to think, oh, I earned this or I did this or um, to kind of put a lot of conditions around things, but just the sense that everything's a gift and how that can free us to be lighter with what we have and how we are with people. Yeah, what else? And when we ask ourselves that question uh, every day and we become more conscious of it, um, we have a baseline. We can create a baseline that will help us see how we're doing in the long term, you know, in terms of, really becoming the persons that we want to be. Uh, and, and that's what's the, the purpose of the Ignatian examen, for instance, you know, is to have, have cultivate that kind of ongoing awareness. Yeah, it also strikes me as, as a, a way of orienting ourselves each day um, to, to perhaps be a person that's going to have a disregard for conventional thinking, as I said at, at our beginning. And uh, because that's what it means to follow Christ, uh, it, it's to go against the conventions and to, to seek a new way, a new way of living, a new way of thinking, of acting, of treating one another. So it really is an, an audacious prayer um, 
Paul, I appreciate you bringing it to, to our attention as a, a way for. Thank you. Can I see? Can I get one more uh, thing in there, Joe? To answer yeah, your, please. To answer your question of yeah. you know what is it praying it every day, I think that you know and Father Allen mentioned the papacy of Pope Francis. Recently, I've been doing work um, on how Catholic communities incarnate Laudato Si, the you know the call to ecological conversion that a number of popes have called for and, and currently um, uh, Pope Francis. And there's a line in there that sticks with me. And I think this is also what the Susipe achieves. It, and the line is, you know, we need to move from what I want to what God's world needs. It's like what I want, to what God's world needs. And like, that shouldn't be shocking to us, <laughs> you know? but like it is. <laughs> um, and um so yeah from what i want to what god's world needs like very you know very uh, yeah. on a basic very very basic level you know how how pope francis says everything is connected in laudato si everything is connected if you stop and think about it the audacity and the freedom that we're talking about has to do with how we li live lives that are connected not just turned inward or introspective for the, for the sake of being introspective, but it's introspection for the sake and interiority development for the sake of engaging and connecting. And, and that's the thing. And I, I, I say this, especially now it's urgent because we realize that among many people, and it's said among many young people, there's been a, a kind of a falling into isolation more and more disconnectedness, you know? So this is a formula for leading a life of, of deep deepening relationships with others. That, that's a great insight, Father Allen. And uh, you know, this this webinar is such a great example of connecting. You know, we have people from all over the world connecting, and we can share. People are sharing thoughts on on the chat, and some of you, like Tim, are able to keep your eye on that while we're having a conversation. I can't do two things at one time, but it, it's wonderful to be able to to share thoughts. By the way, folks, um, if you have questions for our panelists, please put those into the Q&A feature. And in just about a half hour, we'll be uh, moving into the, the Q&A. Uh, any last thought on the, the sushi pay before I move on? I don't want to cut anyone off. I'll, I'll just mention one because one yeah. of our uh, listeners has um, uh, mentioned the same question twice in the chat. So okay. I'll, I'll, I'll get to it. And it is related to just an observation. The question is, uh, is Ignatius using the word understanding in the same sense as the gift of the Holy Spirit in Isaiah? I just, I found that a really perceptive question. Um, and, and and I'll say that, I, it, I, I'd say a partial yes. I don't, I don't see, at least in the research I've done, I don't see a direct borrowing from the language of the book of Isaiah, but I certainly see a consonance between what Isaiah is gesturing to as, you know, as, as a gift of God, because what Ignatius is, talking about here, and, and this, you know, is to your earlier question, something that strikes me when I pray this prayer, nuances that appear to me like, what am I offering to God today uh, that I wasn't offering yesterday or last week or five years ago, you know, and and something that I understand, maybe it's a part of my own self-understanding. Um, I've I, I put it in the language of graced understanding in, uh, in my book, Living Against the Grain, that Praying the examine is about seeking graced understanding of myself, of the world, of my interactions, of my relationships, of my impact, even on the global order following that point about Laudato Si. You know, so, so by offering that to God, I'm effectively asking, please make me understand more and, more and more the way that you do. You're God, I'm not, but, but let me move in that direction. I like that. I, you know, I think there's, uh, you know, we, we sometimes use that phrase, you know, you're God and I'm not. And that's what the sushi pay is doing for us. It's helping us to, to put ourselves in the right place and to put God in the right place. And so I appreciate all the wonderful insights uh, that each of you had. Uh, but I'd like to move on now and talk about another uh, audacious aspect of Ignatian spirituality. And um, this has to do with uh, the notion that, that somehow God wants to communicate with you directly. I'm pointing at every single person that's out there today. Um, so in, in, in her book, um, Marina, uh, the book Ignatian Guides to Forgiveness, she, she writes, God communicates with us 
about the direction of our lives through gentle interior movements. And so I think what, what Marina is going to start us off with here is that, yes, it's audacious to think that God wants to speak to me directly, but there's also a way of listening for how that uh, voice is going to come to us. So Marina, share with us why you thought this aspect is so audacious, and then what do we mean by this gentle interior movements? Thanks. Yeah. So I think often we have this cultural misconception that God speaks to mystics or only spoke to Moses or to Abraham. But Ignatius has this really audacious idea that God is communicating constantly God's self to you and to me. And he talks about a number of different ways that that can take place. He talks about consolation and desolation or listening carefully to interior movements um, this idea that God is communicating with us and that when we feel peace, joy, um, outward movement to connect to others, uh, love, freedom, that those are signs that God is doing something with us that we can pay attention to and trust those kinds of interior movements. Uh, and also, I love the Ignatian emphasis on imagination. So that God uses our imaginations, for example, in a marriage of prayer about the Gospels to communicate something to us and often does it in a way that's really personalized to us, you know, really takes note of our personal histories or what's happening in our lives at the moment, who we in particular are, what our communities are like in doing so. And then, of course, creation, the beauty of creation. Um, it's such a variety of ways that God communicates with us, and it's so individualized incarnational and so very intimate and personal you know in a in a posthumous book that cardinal uh, avery dulles wrote uh, about what is communicating the gospel of jesus he makes the point that in the catholic tradition we're really big on experiencing god through mediations, you know, we're big on the sacraments. We're big on uh, the church itself, uh, the, the saints and so forth. But the Protestants have been big on the, cultivating the personal relationship with God, relating to God more directly, each individual person, you know, assuming responsibility for their lives and so forth and so on. And of course, the point he makes is that both of those approaches are perfectly fine and necessary. But it seems to me that, the, in, in a way, the controversial part of the Ignatian tradition always has been the stress that it puts on achieving a direct relationship with God, a direct one. This is the point that uh, Karl Rahner makes in a, a book that uh, he wrote on um, what would Ignatius say to a Jesuit today? He raises this point that what has always kind of made the Jesuits a little bit off is that we really do believe that God does relate to us directly. We don't fall into sola scriptura or some other heresy, but we do really believe that it's possible. And, and when you think about it, if each and every person is being invited to have that kind of a direct relationship with God, how... Um, uh, motivating that is, you know, for people. And you ask, how is it the Jesuits and others that have worked in ministry have been so audacious? Well, I'd be audacious if I if I knew that God was really so intimately connected with me all the time. See what I mean? So anyway, I think that's why it's so important to this topic that you're developing, Marina. So so important. Yeah, and and Father Allen, you you know as well as anybody that that uh, Ignatius himself. Uh, almost got into you know significant trouble over that. You know he had three you know requests uh, to uh, appear before the Sacred Inquisition. You know because this this kind of sense that you know this guy was kind of a little bit you know half cocked in the way that he was going about his his um, you know professions of of you know doing these spiritual exercises. He was he was accused of being uh, they were called alumbrados or kind of illuminated ones. Um, this this kind of quasi gnostic kind of heretical group and 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 the idea was look you know if this guy is is kind of overreaching and saying i don't need the church you know i've got my own private revelations that sounds dangerous you know if you're a member of the, the inquisition of the 16th century so he got in trouble for it 
you know, but but he was audacious, right? I mean, he 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 found the middle ground. And the middle ground is as I read it, and I know the other panelists have thoughts about this too, but but the middle ground that he found was was what we today are calling discernment, that that listening for the voice of God, it's never uh, you know, Jesus and me and nobody else. You know, it's it's always unfolding in the context of the church's life, the church's own discernment, my relationships with others, those to whom I am responsible. Um, those to whom God is sending me in service, you know. So, so it's 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 never a one-on-one, -on -one exclusive listening to God, but it still is a direct listening to God in that larger context. Yeah, I really appreciate you lifting up this uh, this topic, Marina. Um, you, and yeah, it isn't a one to a one to one. Usually, a spiritual director is helpful too. Um, I, or at least in my, in my experience, like the first time I, I encountered this spiritual exercise, it was almost, it was almost shocking, it, it, particularly the, the theme that you, you brought up Marina, of, whoa, you know, like, you know, in, in the, you know, in the, you know, an hour long prayer, it's like now five minutes, you will listen, listen for God, you know, I'm like, whoa, you know, it's shocking, yeah. you know, and, um, but my spiritual director helped me unpack particularly with the annotations of the exercises like you know this sort of feeling can mean this or that so like listen more deeply and then this when this happens it can mean this or that and and a really deep thoughtful perceptive spiritual director is just worth their weight in gold like and i i i think that is a uh, an often overlooked part of, um, you know, our, our tradition, like what if we were to become this wild network of spiritual directors for each other who can do this for each other? I think, you know, the, the audacity would, the audacity curve would, would go up. Um, one more, one more thing about this theme and sort of where it hit the road, you know, the rubber hit the road for me, mm -hmm. particularly in my twenties, it's another loyal oppress volume. I know we don't have a QR code for it, but it's on my shelf. So, I, what's your decision? It's just a it's by the the folks who were teaching a spiritual direction at, at Loyola Chicago, um, and it it unpacks the annotations for the exercise in a really helpful way. That you know, and um, we're looking for direction. I'm looking for direction now. You know, um, um, you know and um, I think that the exercises plus a good spiritual director offers that um so what's your decision it's a great book great thanks for the plug. I think father that, alan looks like you want to say something yeah well for today's world especially the emphasis on the word that we're using now accompaniment accompaniment and accompaniment is first of all we're we're accompanied by god you know god is is with us okay but also we're accompanied with others and we see it in what is the purpose of spiritual direction, which I kind of like to call spiritual accompaniment, you know, and, and that's the key. We don't go off and make the exercises just by ourselves. We go off and we have feedback coming from someone who's accompanying us, you know, and I really think that that's so important because, uh, you know, that that book that, that the great spiritual writer Henry Nouwen of the 20th century wrote, you know, one of his first uh, efforts to help us understand what is spirituality, he titled it Reaching Out, Reaching Out. And it's all about establishing, once again, we go back to that connections, you know, the, the need to be in relationship because there's too much um, uh, isolation in the world. You know, what do we call it? Ontological individualism in both our American and in modern cultures, I would say, in our world today. And Ignatian spirituality is, is really a, a kind of a response to all that and a wonderful way to, to grow out of it. Yeah. And as we wrap this up, because we have two more audacious points we want to get to, um, I, I'm reminded, too, of something, Paul, that you said about, you know, the shocking nature of it. And we see that in scripture so often, too. The two I thought of uh, in preparation for today, I, I thought of when Mary visits Elizabeth. You know, and Elizabeth is shocked that, you know, who am I that the mother of my Lord should come to me, that somehow God 
was coming into direct contact. The other one I just thought of was Zacchaeus, you know, who climbs the tree. And, you know, Jesus says, I mean to dine with you. I mean, I'm, I'm sure he was looking around like, you're talking to me. Um, you know, there's that, that whole sense of shock and awe that, that the creator of the universe wants to have a relationship with me and and wants to speak with me. But I love what all of you did. And Tim, I think you really, you know, uh, sent us in this direction. Never an individual isolated private experience, but within the context of discernment of, you know, what does our church say and what do the scriptures say and what does my spiritual director say uh, that it's always in that communal context that's so Catholic. So, Marina, thank you for, uh, I think you touched the nerve with this one, uh, as all of you are. Um, these are in, incredibly important points, but uh, we could talk, we could have a whole webinar about each one of these, but in fairness, uh, let's let's move on now and uh, talk about an aspect that Father Allen uh, sent our way. And uh, in particular, uh, Father Allen's going to be talking um, a lo- little bit starting a conversation about the importance of our, our actions uh, and how we preach the gospel through our, our actions. And so I found a quote here from uh, 365 Dias. Um, I- I'm going to attempt to read it in my limited Spanish, but la frase más repetida en ejercicios espirituales es El amor se manifesta más en acciones que en palabras. Um, My apologies if I screwed up any of that. But in English, the most repeated phrase in the spiritual exercises is love is manifested more in actions than in words. And what Father Allen has, has done for this conversation, he said, I'd like to talk about the spiritual exercises. And in particular, um uh, annotation 22 uh father allen why don't you read that to us and then tell us why you chose this as something that you believe is an audacious aspect of ignatian spirituality every good christian ought to be more eager to put a good interpretation on a neighbor's statement than to condemn it this is annotation 22 okay And frankly, I think it is a principle that is fundamental for spiritual growth, this attitude that Ignatius is cultivating there, because uh, I think we're seeing what happens when you don't, especially now in the world that we live in with so much polarization, the connection between our relationship with God and how we live between our prayer and our action has a lot to do with how we are interpreting uh, others and how we are interpreting you know, what we're hearing and what we're experiencing in life. And, and this annotation points out the importance of open-mindedness, the, the importance of being open, the import, and today in the context of the synodal drive of the church, this, this is, which is connected to this topic, but maybe it'd be another one for another webinar sometime, sure. how, how Ignatian spirituality is at the heart of the synodal way, the synodal way, okay? Because what we're talking about is moving, moving toward communion, moving toward unity. And the unity is like the unity we experience in the Trinity itself, the Blessed Trinity itself, which is a very interesting kind of unity. It's a unity in diversity. It's not a unity in uniformity. And so what works against achieving real communion is the inability to actually uh, integrate in some way the reality of the other the other who's not going to be the same is going to be different. In other words, how do we deal with differences? So it's not about being insiders and outsiders, but it's about expanding the circle of uh, inclusivity, huh? of inclusion. And this is a formula for doing that, which in a world of so much polarization, you know, where politically, ideologically, uh, we don't want to deal with one another. And of course, at the heart of it is what we're hearing more and more about is the importance of listening, deep listening, because this annotation once again proposes to us that we learn 
how to deeply listen. First of all, you know, to what God is saying to us, but also what the other is saying to us. And that is not very e not very easy, as you know, huh? because we get locked in um, ideologies. Pope Francis has been very clear about the fact that he doesn't like ideologies, whether it's leftist or rightist or whatever it is, because we're working out of faith and we're working out of trust, which, which leads us to cultivate the ability to really listen to people and to discover where the spirit is, is moving. And the spirit, as you know, just doesn't follow our predilections. It, the spirit has surprises, all kinds of surprises, and we have to be re ready for them and open to them. So that's why I, I love this annotation. I think it's so appropriate, especially uh, in the p time in the world that we're, that we're living through today. I had never heard of this love you, uh, annotation, Father oh, Alan, and I just appreciate it so much. A huge smile came to my face as I read the email with all of our preparatory stuff. I, it's just so fundamental. I think I think that we can either be curious or we can be furious, right? We can be angry <laughs> and like as so I, I find myself, you know, but like I would rather be curious, right? And I think this takes us really important places in that connectedness that we all see and that our church really thrives on. I, I'm also seeing like in the Laudato Sea work that I'm that I'm in the middle of right now, I think that when we don't do this, it creates divisions that are just killing us. <laughs> it's quite literally. But I think we we reify those those divisions more than there actually are. Like I had a call with the Laudato Si movement, the head of North America, and she said, she said, we those divisions are not as big as we think they are. So reach out, like reach out, do what you say, you know, who we need to be doing, you know, to to put this good interpretation. And the church will grow. You know, we will weave what we think is a division, we will weave it back together. Uh, you know, with the help of the Holy Spirit. Okay. Yeah, I think it's so helpful. Um, and I I think it is very challenging, but the for me, the idea that underlies it is this idea that people are seeking what's good and we have to believe in God's goodness and we have to believe that somehow God is working through even very challenging things, things that feel challenging to us. Might There's something good underneath all that and to trust in the, the essential goodness of God and the essential goodness of people. Um, and that's hard for people to do because there's lots of ways we can become defensive or territorial or want to dig in our heels. But um, if I recall, this comes in the context for Ignatius of directors listening to direct tease or people they're companioning and just to, you know, to arrive at that situation saying that I know God is here working with this person and to know that that's true in the wider world as well. It's with our neighbors and our families. I think this is a really challenging thing to do in our family life. Um, but I think it's important to, to assume that, you know, what your spouse says, your teenage child who says, mom, I can't stand your music. Mine are way past that now, <laughs> but you know, there's some differentiation and growth going on in your teenager when your teenager says that stuff. So how do I put a good spin on what someone's saying to me, even if it's very challenging? Well, my my adult children still don't like my music, Marina. So maybe, maybe, <laughs> oh, well, maybe so. Well, just wait a few but, years. Uh, a few anyway, years. Um, no, I, Alan, I, I I love I love that you chose this uh, element to focus on. Uh, timely, timely topic. Uh, I love the fact that you put it in the context of Ignatius's own kind of you know Tridentine era. Uh, again, you know, as well as I do, that his advice to those Jesuits attending the Council of Trent was listen, 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 you know, don't don't just come with the hammer and, and, and you know, kind of put people in their place. Um, obviously, a very contentious period, very much like our own. Um, this is an era of fragmentation. Um, but but yeah, this the spirituality of, of listening um, and, and you said it of synodality of, of walking together. In, in a common, or at least trying the, the best we can to walk together in a common direction. I just, I just, I just love that you're highlighting all those points. I uh, was on uh, social media the other day and uh, got into a conversation with someone, not an argument, it was a conversation, political though. 
and uh, disagreement. We're both coming from different sides, and, and I offered, you know, a couple of uh, uh, opinions about something, and I waited for a response. I was ready to be attacked, and, and my friend who responded said, good point. And I, I was like, whoa, I, I haven't seen that in a long time, and I really want to reach out to this person and say thank you for engaging in a conversation and just listening to what I had to say, and, and may I do that with others, too, you know, pray for the grace to, to be able to say, no, I listened to what you said, that that was a good point, and so thank you, Father Allen, for bringing this forward for us. It is a, a very timely for us. Speaking of time, uh, we want to get to our last conversation here, and um by the way, folks, if you have questions for our panel, go to the Q&A and put in your questions there. And Denise is getting ready to, to pop out from behind the curtain in about eight minutes or so to uh, share questions with our panel. But we're going to look at the, the conversation that Tim has uh, uh, brought to us. And, and it's uh, the notion that the, Ignace, the message of Ignatian spirituality uh, is both simple and yet at the same time has such great depth to it. And, and so, Tim, tell us a little bit about your thinking here. I have a quote from, from your book, Living Against the Grain. If you want to talk, refer to that a little bit. But why is this uh, audacious that Ignatian spirituality can be so deep, so complex, and yet at the same time, so simple? Yeah. And what I had in mind, Joe, was that you can teach basics to children, you know, and I speak from experience of, of you know, starting with my very young daughters when, when they were five and three, and now they're, you know, 24 and 21. Um, but, you know, asking them at the end of the day, you know, what's one thing that made you happy today? What's one thing that made you sad? And what's one thing that you're hoping for tomorrow? And, and, and that was my proto examine prayer with them you know, at a very, very young age. So, you know, just kind of conveying that we can find God by reflecting on our experience. You know, that's very, very simple. You know, that 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 doesn't require all kinds of kind of doctrinal um, download. You don't have to have, you know, studied theology. You can just go into your experience in a reflective way. I think you just have to be able to be alive, you know, so that's, that's simple. Um, but I will say that what I had in the back of my mind when I when I uh, first broached this at, at your suggestion, um, it was it was a it was a saying that I'd learned way back decades ago from a professor of mine, and I've never located the original source. But but it went something like um, speaking of scripture in a similar way, scripture is like a river in which the lamb can wade and the elephant can swim. Mm -hmm. Lovely image, you know, the lamb can sort of wade, you know, and so the idea that that. Anybody can just kind of dip their feet into these these Ignatian practices of examine of even like we talked about before with the sushipe. Um, anybody can can do that. It just turn their desire over to God, and and yet as I get older, I find that that really being invited into depth is 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 kind of where I am at, at my life stage. You know of 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 saying you know what. What is, to use Ignatius's word, the more, um, the greater glory of God um, to which God is inviting me? So, again, there's an audacity to that. It's not a one and done. I sort of signed up for it. I get the newsletter and I'm happily moving on my way. Um, you know, there really is a sense of that, 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 that God is, is inviting us into more and more. And, and, and if we are willing, we can say yes to that again and again and again. So to me, that's audacious. You know, I'd like to, a word that Francis uses a lot um, in Spanish, cercanía, the closeness, the nearness of God. And, and you know, when we're accompanied with someone, when somebody is with us, when someone is alongside us, it's, it's just a different kind of experience of, of reality. We're not isolated. You know, we're not turned in on ourselves. We're not lonely, you know, because we know that we are, uh, someone's with us, someone's with us. And we can do all kinds of things that otherwise we wouldn't be able to do. It's a really simple idea, but I've seen it over and over again, especially working with the poor, especially working with pe people, that are struggling with life and you know with immigrants and, and refugees and and you see how 
it's you know it's such a tremendous thing. I I thought recently of um, a quote from Maya Angelou, uh, Angelou the the poet. Let's see, it goes something like this. She said, um, "Courage is the most important of the virtues because without it, no other virtue can be practiced consistently." Okay. And the presence of God with us gives us courage, it seems to me, that we otherwise wouldn't have. And we can talk about, we haven't talked about courage very much, but you can see how it's connected to audaciousness and liberty sure. and all these things. You know, it's risk-taking. Yeah, courage. But we don't have courage unless someone's there holding our hand. And there is. Tim, I also like that you use the word simplicity because I think, you know, on the one hand, in a nation's spirituality, there's the emphasis on interior movements and imagination, right? And this very um, active side to Ignatius action in the world. But there is also this side of simplicity, gratitude, right? Just being with God and looking at the green of the grass, right? The, there's a side to Ignatius that's deeply contemplative in a quieter way too. And as I'm getting older, you know, I'm moving that way <laughs> significantly in my own prayer life. Um, and I think there's a lot to be said about the depth of simplicity, you know, just being here and being with and letting God be with us has a lot. And Ignatius, it's in there in Ignatius along with the other stuff. Uh, thanks for highlighting this theme, uh, Tim. I really, I love it, particularly as um, a parent of young people and beginning to invite them into the faith and into prayer. This is one of my, this is not Loyola Press, but this is like one of my favorite books ever. Uh, the Religious Potential of the Child can, shows how deep children can go. Um, I, there's a line in there that's like, teach me to be close to God on my own, you know? And so this is the, this is what we must do, you know? And like, this is my, my sons are seven and four, our sons are seven and four, seven and five, wow, it's seven and five. Um, and as we, as we wrote the examine book, we had it in mind that a grown up who loves this stuff, you know, and has been doing it for years and years, is going to be sort of onboarding, you know, a person they love profoundly, you know, and it needs to work on both levels for it to work, you know, um, and to invite parents into this practice and children into this practice is a really humbling thing. And, and but to hear the stories sort of coming out of folks engaging and, and what it has sort of grown in families it's just a wild thing, you know, and it's, it's, an, it's an audacious thing for a parent to be right. right. It's like this following Jesus is the adventure. Like let's do it together. You know, that's, that is um, uh, not conventional thinking or whatever Joe said at the beginning, yeah. you know, a disregard for conventional thing. Yeah, um, exactly. So anyway, I, it's a, it's, it's been a, to grace, to, to hear the reaction. Yeah. yeah. And something I don't think we, we appreciate enough is that in our Catholic tradition, we got access to all these stories. Um, that's why that little book I did in Spanish on the saints, okay. I mean, it's incredible, the situations and the kinds of saints, that, and now they're becoming even more interesting. I just was in Italy, and I went to the grave of uh, Carlo Acutis, you know, that 15-year-old. Yeah. It's a fantastic oh, yeah. story. I don't know if you've... Anyway, mm. if, if it's about action to transform the world, the way it's going to happen is not by a political theory or a philosophy or a theology even. It's going to be the power of good stories that stimulate the imagination and the will more than all kinds of other ways that we might want to do that. Not that I'm against any of those other things. I'm just saying... Yeah. We really need to appreciate the biblical stories, of course, first of all, but also the richness of the story of the saints, canonized and not canonized, that yes. we know of. Yes, I've been uh, telling catechists for, for quite a while now that when we're teaching the faith that we need to be storytellers. There's three kinds of stories, the stories from scripture, uh, mm -hmm. stories of the saints, and our stories. And I think that's the last one is one that 
the new evangelization has brought to us that some of us are still not accustomed to, you know, what do you mean my story? I don't have a story, uh, but we all do. And if we stop and think and pray about these, we were able to share our, our stories of how we feel God has somehow entered into my life and touched me in such a way that made me change my direction a little bit here or there. It doesn't have to be as dramatic as Paul being, you know, knocked off the horse and the lightning and hearing voices and so on. But, you know, God does enter into our lives. And one of the, the, the last thought I'll share, and then we're going to get to our Q&A, is that the, one of my joys here at Loyal Press is having the opportunity to review, do a catechetical review of resources for the, the little children, you know, the preschool, kindergarten, or children with special needs. And in that in particular, I remember doing a review of resources for children with special needs. They had no words. It was all images. And I thought, this is so beautiful because we had to boil it down to the simplest message without dumbing it down, without making it simplistic. And I just thought it was incredibly powerful. And so, the, Tim, you bring in this whole idea of thank you so much. Uh, I think it is audacious for us to, to think that we can talk about God in simple ways when God is also so deep and so complex, but it's both and. Um, each of you, thank you for, for being so wise and so deep and for articulating things in such a simple manner for all of us. I think that's why these uh, webinars are, are so wonderful and give us an opportunity to hear some very deep, profound thoughts spoken in a way that, you know, the, the average Joe can understand and say, oh, okay, I, I get it. Uh, so Denise is back and she's been collecting some questions. Uh, for us and our panelists have answers. So Denise, let's get rolling. All right, and uh, anybody can jump into these as we go. But I think this first question was in response to Marina's point. Um, Hayden asks, do you think that God is also audacious in breaking into our own lives? Yes, I think God is audacious and in breaking into our own lives. I mean, it's God's nature, right? Because God made us. So why wouldn't God be part of our lives? Um, like we're his progeny, right? We're his, we're God's, her, we're God's, you know, being um, in a certain sense in the world in a very particular way. And so, yes, I think God wants to break into our lives and is doing it. It's a question of, are we noticing? Not whether God's doing it, but are we noticing and listening? That makes me think of what Francis has often said, expect surprises. Mm -hmm. He's he's a big believer in surprises. And a lot of people, as you know, don't like surprises, but that's how God, you know, is working. The uh, language of, of Jeremiah comes to mind here when he sort of complains to God, you've seduced me, you've duped me, you know, yeah. like God is kind of like, oh yeah, I'm going to go there. I'm going to get you, you know, that kind of thing, that, that, that sense of, you know, almost insistently listen to me come to me i want to be your friend yeah yeah very audacious robert asks um if the panelists could maybe offer a few thoughts about audacious prayers and god's communication in times of consolation and desolation Every prayer is an audacious prayer if we have in the back of our mind um, Moses before God and the terror and the horror of um, I'm going to die if I see God face to face. And effectively what Ignatius is saying is God wants to see us face to face. Um, God wants to draw us in. So so this 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 invitation to intimacy with God and the ability to speak directly to God, as we spoke about earlier in the webinar, um, makes, I think, any form of prayer a potentially audacious form of prayer to dare to approach the, the throne of um, the divine majesty, as Ignatius's term um, there. Um, so, yeah, I think that's pretty audacious. I mean, I think one audacious okay. aspect yeah. is this idea that the... Um, uh, we can, when we pray imaginative prayer, let prayer go where God wants to take us. Um, so if you pray with the scriptural scene, for example, maybe it's a Sunday gospel or something that you just find resonant with your own life. 
to let God do what God's going to do with it. You know, it doesn't have to be following the story very line by line, but to let God in there in the unique way God's going to do with you. Uh, I think that's something Ignatius offers. You know, that um, gospel about the young man that came to Jesus and said, what should I do in order to be perfect and so forth? You know, and she says, go sell all that you have and give to the poor and come follow me. And, and the, um, and the guy just couldn't do it. He couldn't respond. Okay. Well, somebody was using that for their prayer during the spiritual exercises. And when they came back to share with me, you know, what they what happened when they allowed, as Marina was was saying, their imagination to get involved, you know, to put themselves in the scene and do the Ignatian uh, contemplation approach. She said, Well, I was the I was the young man looking at Jesus, and when, when Jesus told me that, I said to him, I can't do that. I can't do that. I can't go away, sell all the poor and, and follow you just like that. And then Jesus looked at her and she imagined that Jesus said to her, well, okay, but come along anyway. <laughs> now that was a product of her imagination. It wasn't in the scripture, but that's exactly what she needed to hear because it's, there, it's a gradual. In other words, Jesus is not into, you know, all or nothing, you know, he'll take whatever he can get. And, and we see that, I think, we see that in terms of our spiritual growth and so forth. Uh, so that's an example of how if we let our imaginations, we sometimes can learn a, a lesson that God really wants to communicate. I think one, you know, if, I, if I've heard the, the question right, an audacious way to pray, is particularly when we want to consider our consolation and desolation, is to give the best part of our day, like the choicest bit, right, to prayer. And like a lot of it and consistently. Um, maybe this isn't what you're, you know, what you're hoping for in the answer, but I think if every day we chunk out, you know, half an hour to an hour of like your best brain, you know, time, and then like if this is what we offer to God. Because uh, it's so easy to to not do that, to like to to mortgage you know our time to other things. Um, but, but I think when we cultivate that solitude in that way, that's when we can listen and and be really attuned, um, you know, to the the theme that Marina brought us, but also you know the the consolation, the desolation that's that are surely um, you know braided in our life definitely denise you have another one for us um i do uh laura wonders how we can practice the audacity this attitude of audacity on a daily basis i think it's so personal right it's so personal if i could tell sort of a silly story there's a, a child who my sister used to uh, babysit for, and after he would, would um, he was he was uh, potty training, right? And he would, would say to her, um, "Do you think that I have to pee?" You know, like, and of course the, he was the only one who knew if he had to pee. You know. And like, it's similarly with our vocations, like we are the only ones who know like how God is speaking us into the world in an audacious manner, right? And it's, it's you know, it's a very personal thing as we've been, you know, talking about over and over. Like, it's about our gifts. Um, and so, oh gosh, I forget the woman's name who said it or the whoever's. But I think you know, you know, I, I, it, when we, when we do pray, it, it comes out as a, a very personal response. So. I like, I like. That's a great question. I agree with everything you just said. You know, it's so personal. I, I do think maybe the sushi pay going back to that um, might be helpful. Also, thinking about how do I just kind of keep in mind that everything's a gift, and how do I try to say thank you to what I'm doing in the day, right? A kind of simple practice, but it can be an audacious practice just to kind of show up. Here's what the day's presenting me. It could go this way. It could go that way. I got to go the way the day goes, kind of. 
I have to live my life, the life I've been given. And then how do I respond and keep responding out of sense of gratitude or a sense of thank you. One, one more thought coming at it slightly differently. Uh, Ignatius once wrote this fascinating letter to some young Jesuits in uh, Coimbra in Portugal. And uh, the content of the letter, just to you know, kind of summarize it, he effectively was saying, don't pray so much. Get out and do your work. Uh, he he was saying, look, you know, we're, we're not we're not monks, you know, we're not we're not praying the daily office, and that's our vocation, you know. That 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 for Ignatius, um, ultimately, the transformation that was happening in prayer should manifest itself more in deeds than in words, you know. So so you know, not not don't just repeat your prayer. The prayers are good. But but the measure ultimately is: Are you living a life that is reflective of the glory that, that God is bringing forth through you? So right. you know, so so to not not get st stuck, as it were, in the prayer. I mean, and, and again, this is Ignatius being audacious. You're not supposed to be the same who says, "Don't pray so much," you know. But effectively, he's saying, <laughs> you know, keep in mind where the focus is. The focus is on God is trying to transform the world through you being what I created you to be. Right. Right. The same idea that I was thinking, Tim, because in that letter too, or later on, the question is, is uh, arises: if I don't have time to pray, you know, for whatever reason, okay. Ignatius answer was that: well, listen, listen, if you don't have time to pray, at least do the examine of consciousness. Yeah. At least do the examination consciousness, because what that's about is becoming aware of the main motivations that keep you from being the person that God is calling you to be, you know? And and most of us, you know, we prefer to remain kind of zombies, repeating the same action without really getting behind. What, what is behind this pattern in my life? We don't even recognize the patterns frequently. But that's that's the beauty of the examine of consciousness, you know? So, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, it reminds me of... Uh kind of what you were talking about, Paul, but all of you have, have touched on this in some way. And whenever I go to see my spiritual director, and I've been seeing spiritual directors for over 20 years, on my way there, I always think, what am I going to talk about? I have, I have nothing to talk about. And I have never, ever had a trouble filling up that hour. Because once you start talking, like you said, Paul, you know, you know, and you just realize that I'm talking about this for 45 minutes. It must be important to me. Um, so thank you. Those were great questions. Denise, thank you for sorting them out. And, and to our panel, thank you for answering them on the spot. Um, we wish we could toss a, a lot more and listen to you a lot more, but our time is up. Uh, I can't thank you uh, enough, panelists, uh, for the, this wonderful conversation. I can't believe the time has flown by. A wonderful conversation, again, deeply profound and yet elegantly simple. Uh, and, and so I think you embodied you know, what you were saying in, in all of uh, the uh, audacious points of uh, Ignatian spirituality that you were sending our way. So thank you, panelists, for being uh, with us today. And uh, thank you to all of uh, our participants for being with us. Please, please do take a look at the, the, the books of our wonderful authors. Each of the, the folks who is on our panel uh, is a Loyola Press author. And so uh, Marina's Ignatian Guide to Forgiveness and Paul's, Paul's Audacious Ignatius and Tim's Living Against the Grain and uh, Father um, Allen's, uh, I'm going to say this without looking at my notes, uh, tres, Trescientos. 65 dias, um, and uh, other books as well. Now, uh, some of them have written more than one book. Um, you can find these books uh, through the QR codes on your screen. You can go to store.loyolapress.com. You can call our 800 number, 621-1008. During business hours, you will speak to a real live human being. Good friends of mine who are answering the phones there all day, the nicest people. And finally, once again, a recording will be available soon, uh, both at IgnatianSpirituality.com, as well as sent by email to all the folks who have registered. Thank you, panelists, once again. Thank you to all of you. God bless you. Enjoy the rest of this month celebrating all things Ignatian.
Until next time, Joe Paprocki. God bless. <laughs>